Welcome to another video for STAT212. In this video, we're going to um, be looking at confidence intervals. Uh, so confidence intervals are an important part of inference. So we've talked about um, kind of these different um, pieces of this relationship before, where um, if we kind of think about um, there being um, this truth, um, these parameters that we're interested in, this population or distribution that exists, um, but we collect some observed data, we're not going to know exactly what those parameters are or what that truth is. Um, if we knew what that truth was, then we could use probability to determine how likely we are to see particular sample results, particular sample statistics. We can describe our observed data with descriptive statistics. Um, but usually our goal, um, I say usually, I guess it doesn't have to be, but, but often our goal is going to be inference, where we're trying to take our observed data and try to say something about what could be true about this population, about these parameters of interest um, that we, we might be looking at. So confidence intervals um, are kind of our first um, um, introduction into really doing inference now, where we have some observed data, we have a sample statistic, and we're trying to determine where the parameter could reasonably be, um, probably in some range around our sample statistic. And we're gonna use some of the, the things that we've discussed before, so we're gonna talk about you know, the distribution of a sample statistic is kind of our big um, tool for determining um, where a parameter could reasonably be. So kind of using these principles over here um, for the purpose of inference now. So uh, if you think about um, some questions where we might construct a confidence interval, um, we might be uh, trying to approximate um, a true population mean given a sample mean. So for example, what is the average amount that Americans are paying out of pocket for emergency room visits? So there exists a true average number that um, um, US Americans are paying for their, for their emergency room visits. We don't know what that is. We could collect some, some data and try to kind of approximate what that could be, um, but there does exist some parameter that we're not gonna know. Um, another example that we'll talk about in this chapter is working with proportions. So, so in addition to inference for a mean, we could also do inference for a proportion, like a, a percentage, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so what proportion of cancer patients who undergo chemotherapy show tumor shrinkage? So this would be a question that helps us determine kind of the effectiveness of this method, where we can observe some data and see how, how effective it is and try to make a claim about, in general, how effective it likely is. So, um, as a reminder from the previous chapter, our sample statistic is typically going to be our best estimate of a population parameter. We did talk a little bit about bias versus um, non-biased statistics there. So, so technically, if we have a biased statistics, we might we might have to kind of adjust it or use something different. But in general, um, a statistic. Um, is going to be a, our best estimate for the parameter it is kind of representing. So a sample mean is going to be our best estimate for a population mean, a sample proportion will be our best estimate for a population proportion, and then we could go on with different statistic parameter relationships. That said, we also recognize that there's going to be some error in our sample statistic, because if we only have a sample, um, we know that sample statistics vary a little bit, that sample statistics have a distribution of possibilities that can happen. Um, so, so if I collect a sample of 100 people and somebody else collects a sample of 100 people and somebody else collects a sample of 100 people and we all um, calculate our own descriptive statistics, they're all gonna be a little bit different. Uh, my sample mean will be a little bit different than this one, which will be a little bit different than this one. And that's because um, these sample means kind of exist within a distribution of possible sample means that I could get. Um, and they should be centered around the true mean. So if it's an unbiased statistic, then it will be centered on that true parameter. But I could be over here, I could be over here, and that's where kind of this, this inference process comes in. It's trying to determine how likely I am to be a certain distance away from the true parameter. So a confidence interval is a very straightforward kind of estimation tool where what we're gonna do is build an interval around our statistic, around our point estimate, which is most likely gonna be our sample statistic, um, for which we are fairly confident that the true parameter of interest is inside this interval. Um, so, so again, we're trying to estimate the position of a parameter. We're going to 
take our sample statistic or whatever our point estimate is. Like, th there are some cases where, where our point estimate will not be a sample statistic, but in this class it, it always will. Um, so we're going to take our point estimate and build this interval around it and try to make a claim about how confident we are that this interval contains whatever the true parameter most likely is. Now this distance that we extend out is called the margin of error for our confidence interval. So this is like how far off we are kind of allowing, how much error we're kind of allowing in our singular estimate. Um, so, so if we're this far off, um, then, um, then that's kind of our tolerance level. Um, if we're farther off than that, then we're, or, or if the true parameter is farther away from that, then, then we're going to miss it with our interval. Um, but we're going to extend our interval this certain amount such that we are X percent confident that we are including the population parameter. So commonly, we're going to do a 95% confidence interval. It doesn't have to be that. And we'll talk about doing different ones as well. Um, but a 95% confidence interval means that we are confident that 95% of the time, if we extend out this distance from whatever sample statistic we got, that the true parameter will be contained inside that interval. So you can kind of think about a confidence interval as being x bar plus or minus the margin of error, or if we're doing a confidence interval for the true population proportion, it would be p hat plus or minus the margin of error. But this probably brings in a good question of how far do we extend? How do we know what that margin of error is supposed to be? Um, and so that's where kind of sampling distributions come in that we talked about before. So the distribution of the sample statistic that we have. Um, so number one, um, we do have to decide what our confidence level is going to be. So if we want to be 95% confident, that's going to be one distance. If we want to be 99% confident, that's going to be a wider distance. So if I want to be more confident, I need to contain, um, or I need to um, kind of stretch out my interval to include more possibilities. If I'm okay being just 90% confident, I don't need to extend out quite as far. So confidence level is one um, decision that will affect how wide our confidence interval is. Second is going to be the standard error of our sample statistic. In other words, how, um, how much error we expect to have in our sample statistic um, given um, the information about what we collected, so like our sample size and given how much variability there is in the, in the variable itself. Um, so, so the larger the standard error in our sample statistic, the more error we should allow in this interval, the, the farther out we need to stretch. So let's kind of focus on confidence intervals for population means um, for the first part of this chapter. So let's kind of consider this fictional distribution. So this is kind of like the truth, um, you know, if we can think of it that way. So, so this, this is some distribution representing the, um, the fictional salaries of individuals who graduate with a bachelor's degree in statistics. Um, I just kind of made it up, it's not real, but it's just gonna represent our population um, for this problem. So there exists a true parameter. There, there's just a true mean of this distribution, and that is mu equals $70,000. There also exists a true standard deviation in this population, and that's going to be sigma equals $20,000. But if we're doing inference, we're not going to know this information. That's kind of why we're doing statistics, is because we know that this exists, but we don't want to know what it is, but we want to try to make claims about what could be true. Um, if you remember what we talked about in chapter six, we know that if we were to continuously sample from this population for a particular n, so let, let's just say that we're gonna do samples of size 30, and we're kind of evaluating um, what sample means I would get if I was continuously sampling samples of size 30, then there going, is going to exist a distribution of possible x bars, of possible sample means that I can get if I'm sampling of size 30 from this population. Um, so, so this right here represents kind of my distribution of possible X bars. Okay. So recognize here that um, um, Obviously, x bar can be a little bit different each time I sample. It should be centered 
around $70,000. So, so it should be centered around mu. But sometimes I'll get a sample mean a little bit below. Sometimes I'll get a sample mean a little bit above. You might also notice that this distribution is normally distributed. Maybe it's a little bit hard to tell from the picture, but um, that this is normally distributed because of the central limit theorem, that even if the population distribution itself is not normally distributed, um, a distribution of possible sample means likely will be normally distributed if n is large enough, if the samples I'm taking to generate these sample means is large enough. And in this case, 30 seems to be working in this particular shape. Um, we also know that the standard deviation of this distribution of possible sample means is going to be represented as sigma over the square root of n. And we commonly call this the standard error of the sample mean. Our standard error of act bar. And that's representing the expected error in x bar um, if we take an x bar at random from a random sample. Or, or I should say, should say if we take a random sample and generate an x bar. So, so that's going to kind of represent how much error we should expect to get on average when we do this. All right. So this is like the truth, and this is kind of the, the probabilistic understanding of what's going on. We start from the truth. We can generate how likely I am to get different sample results, in this case, different sample means. And there is a distribution of possible sample means that I could get. However, if we're doing inference, we're not going to have all that information. Instead, literally all we have is our one sample. So in this case, our one sample of size 30, it looks like this. We get a sample mean. So this is like our x bar. Is, is represented by that red line there. It's the, the mean of our particular sample there. And I know that it's probably going to be off by, by some margin. I don't know exactly how much, but I know it's going to be off. Unless I just get really lucky and get 70,000 in my sample mean. I guess it's possible, but probably unlikely. Um, so that's why I might use a confidence interval, um, is that I'm pretty sure that mu is probably somewhere around it, um, the sample mean that I got. But, uh, but I want to kind of estimate with a certain level of confidence of where mu most likely is. Well, I can take advantage of the fact that I know the distribution of possible sample means is likely going to be normally distributed, like, like it is in this picture. And I know that my x bar is going to be somewhere in this distribution, even if I don't know where mu is, right? So, I, so maybe I don't know where this is, but I know that this distribution exists around mu, wherever it is. So I can kind of use properties of normal distributions to calculate how likely I am to be within certain ranges of mu a certain percentage of the time. So in particular, I know that 95% of all sample means should fall within about 1.96 standard errors of mu. So just for the same reason that 95% of observations fall within 1.96 standard deviations of the mean in a normally distributed population, we can just say the same thing about sample means in a sampling distribution because they're normally distributed. It's, it's, this is still true. Um, so I can take advantage of the fact that that's true. And this distance now is going to be my margin of error. So in other words, what I'm saying is that 95% of the time, I'm going to be within this range of mu. So wherever I am on this, on this spectrum, if I stretch out this far, then 95% of the time, that's far enough to find mu, and 5% of the time, I'm too far away. 5% of the time, that distance isn't going to quite get me to mu. I'm not going to reach it. But 95% but of the time, I'm going to reach mu if that's the distance that I'm stretching out. So that's where we get this margin of error value. That's how we know how far to extend out. Um, so another way that we can kind of visualize this is coming up, but I'll review that in just a second. Um, so let's kind of take a second and, and quantify what we're doing here. So, so originally we said that a confidence interval for, for mu is going to be represented as x bar plus or minus the margin of error. And now we're just going to unpack how we calculate that margin of error. That margin of error is going to be the appropriate z value or z score associated with our confidence level times our standard error. So in other words, if we want to be 95% confident that I'm going to that I'm going to stretch out 1.96 standard errors from the mean. So so if so if z is 
So z.95 is 1.96. But as I mentioned before, we don't have to stick with 95% confidence interval, so that's why we just say z, because I can substitute different values if I want to be different um, levels of confidence with my confidence interval. So if I want to be 98% confident, um, then the range I'm going to stretch out is 2.33 standard errors from the mean. That's how, like, that's how far away from the mean I'd have to go to capture 98% of the possible sample means. Uh, if I only want to be 90% confident, then I only need to stretch out 1.65 standard errors because that's like how far I would go to capture the 90% of sample means around the population mean. So you can kind of think about this on your own. Um, so given this information, uh, a 98% confidence interval for the mean is going to be represented as what? So take a second and think about it, plug it in. Um, I will meanwhile plug it in, this is, again, this is a video. So this is going to be x bar plus or minus 2.33 times the standard error for x bar. Great, so let's think about this from the beginning. Let's say we're trying to find the average student height among UIUC students. We gather a representative sample of 24 students and plot their heights. The dots represent the individual heights. The blue ver vertical line represents our sample mean. So here in this picture, we, uh, we plotted, we got some data, we asked some people their heights. Uh, this blue line represents our sample mean, our X bar value. And this interval represents the confidence interval that we built to try to capture mu. Uh, we decided to build this confidence interval by stretching out 1.96 standard errors. Um, so we calculated the standard error of our sample mean, which, by the way, we're going to talk about this. Remember how we talked about the whole, like, sigma over the square root of n is an approximate, uh, is approximately represented by our sample standard deviation over the square root of n. So we haven't talked about that yet. We're going to pretend that this isn't a thing yet. We're going to pretend that we can calculate this right now, even though we can't. Um, so let's say that we calculated this value, that we somehow knew sigma here. Um, then we can calculate the standard error of the sample mean, and we can stretch out 1.96 standard errors in either direction from our sample mean. We know that 95% of the time, our sample mean is going to be in this 95% zone. It's going to be in the 1.96 standard error zone around mu, and our confidence interval then will correctly include mu when we stretch it out. However, we also know that 5 out of 100 times, it's not going to work. 5 out of 100 times, we're going to be too far away, and our interval is not going to include um, the true parameter. So that's kind of where we have to be careful with confidence intervals, is, is when we say 95% confident, we really mean 95% confident. It means that 5% of the time, we're going to miss the true parameter. And that's, that's how statistics is, that's how probabilistic arguments are, is we're making a statement with a certain level of confidence but we can never be 100% sure. There's no such thing as a 100% confidence interval when we just have some random sample of the population. I suppose we could have a 100% confidence interval if we capture the entire possible range of that variable. I mean, that seems a little bit silly. Um, but in statistics, we're only making arguments with the level of confidence. We can't be 100% sure. We can be pretty close to it. We can, we can get pretty high if we want to stretch out more and more standard errors. Um, but we're never going to be 100% sure.